All right, welcome back. We're talking to Command Sergeant Major Ted Furson, and uh, we're talking about, I believe, NORAD. Yeah. Right. All right. So fill us back in. What happened there? Where did you do, and what other commands you had? Well, NORAD was the last assignment that I had before I retired, and uh, I got promoted to uh, E9 in in NORAD, and it was a uh, Another one of those eye-opening assignments. It's uh, you learn a lot when you're doing things like that. NORAD is a really complex activity. The command headquarters itself is one quarter of a mile inside Cheyenne Mountain. They drilled back in there and they dug it all out. It's all granite. And one of the most impressive things in there is you go through the blast doors. They're about they're about ten feet tall, and there's two of them and uh, once you get in there you notice that all the rocks have got big bolts in them where the hard rock miners are stiffening up the complex itself and they can operate in there there's two lakes on the inside of the mountain for fresh water they have their own aid station they have their own mess hall and they can button up in there and stay for at least 60 days without a problem at all. Really? Yeah. Now you said the doors were 10 feet high. How about as far as thickness on the doors? Were they three feet? Three feet thick? They're called blast doors. The mountain is supposed to be able to withstand a thermonuclear blast and still continue to operate its communications. Another reason why they put those drill holes in the concrete and the rocks you were saying? They had the, said they had drill bits or? Uh, yeah, they, they blasted them out. This is a huge, huge place inside that mountain. You, uh, there are seven buildings in there at the time, and the buildings were about 300 feet long, and they're all mounted on springs big around as this disk. There's, uh, I think, 23 of them down one side, the other side, and squared up. They are, they are huge. So if the mountain rocked, the building wouldn't. It was like stabilizers. Yes, it was. That's exactly what they were. And the command center in there was operated uh, continuously because it's NORAD and they protect the United States. Uh, they keep track of every commercial flight that is going across America and it looks like a spider web up on the, on the, uh, they also keep track of all the subs that are at sea and all the ships that are at sea. And they can, they can identify through backscatter radio, uh, radar, it's no longer classified now, the, the 440L, but they can identify by bouncing a beam off of the ionosphere down to a Russian site where they're launching missiles and they can tell exactly what's happening and whether a launch occurs, which gives uh, a few minutes notice. <coughs> Excuse me. NORAD was very interesting because the computers that, that the people now see as home PCs Back in those days, uh, they were very complex and they were huge. Uh, we have uh, the ability to operate those different computers, which were installed by the lowest bidder, of course. Uh, <laughs> That's the way it always is. <laughs> yeah. Some of the people had real problems trying to get A to talk to B because one is Honeywell, the other is GE, another is IBM, you know. Uh, but they, they worked it all out, and the communications that they had from there through England, all of Canada, United States, Alaska, the Philippines, every place that they had a station, they had instant communications to it, to include SAC in, in uh, Omaha and Washington, D.C., of course. It was a really eye-opening assignment. Does that base still exist? That yes, it does. It's still it's there? It's yes, still it manned? does. Yes, it does. Wow. Uh, it's, it's truly an amazing thing. You can even write for a tour. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. There's one place you've never seen our league take mail call go through there, though. You know, all the things that he did, you've never seen that episode. <laughs> that would have been an eye-opener to see, but I know you can take tours through it. That'd be something. Well, they, they were conducting tours. They're, they're, they take them in and show them the mountain, and they show them the operations center. But That'd they be show a place nice to go to. Really, I'd like to do that. Yeah, it's, it's really neat to see. Uh, yeah. Well, after that, I retired, 
came out on order that says Command Sergeant Major of 2nd Infantry, 2nd Infantry Division, and uh, I decided I'd had enough overseas service, and so I just said, I'll just go do something better. <laughs> so I retired and moved to Las Vegas, all right? And I'd like to get on to something else that I want to talk about now. Sure. Which, yeah, I stayed at Las Vegas for a long time, and then we moved over to Pahrump here. We now have what's called a Military Retiree Council here in Pahrump. This is part of uh, the Army's continuing effort to upgrade the, uh, the status and the participation of retirees. If something is wrong with your benefits, they don't always know because they're not retired yet. So the Department of the Army is one of the first people to put out a, uh, a retiree council. And that council consists of seven officers. They're all generals. Uh, and seven enlisted men. They're all sergeant majors. But they come from the different areas around the country and they convene in Washington, D.C. once a year in April. And they recommend changes to, to uh, legislation and to benefit packages and they do some good. Uh, they don't get everything that they want, but they, they do some good. We, and this Pahrump Council, are part of Presidio of Monterey, the California Nevada Council. Okay. And we have a Brigadier General named, uh, named Gilbert who runs that <coughs> California Nevada organization. And he also sits on the Department of the Army Council because he's an, he's an Army General Officer. Here in Pahrump, we were very fortunate. We had uh, Neil Beer, who was a Major General, U.S. Air Force retired, very knowledgeable individual. We have a tremendous uh, group of people on the board here for this. And I want to mention some of them if I can. Sure. Neil Beer is our general officer member. Uh -huh. I'm the chairman. Colonel Waters, the lieutenant colonel, Air Force, retired. He's the vice chairman. We have Bob Arndt, and he was the DAV commander, and he's now going to take my place on this council uh, because I can only stay on it for two years. And we have Clyde Riggins and Reginald Knight, who's a retired first sergeant, Marine right. Corps. I know Reggie. Yeah. Yeah, we were start of the Marine Corps League together. We have Dorothy Stunden. She's a Navy captain. We have First Sergeant Kenton Faleros. He's a uh, Army First Sergeant, retired. We have Kenneth Hoskins. He's a warrant officer, retired. We have a Master Sergeant Jolly, who was an Air Force member, retired. And we have a Sergeant Stunden, David. And he's Dorothy Stunden's husband, and he represents the in Air Force enlisted people. Right. And we have Earl Bishop, SFC U.S. Army. He's our, our recorder. And he's also the adjutant of the uh, American Legion at Post 40. And we have Bob Hammond, who is a, our veteran member. He's a coordinator for military service organizations. What we did is there are 917 retirees that we have the name and address of. We don't have their email and we don't have their phone number. So we did the best we could by trying to get these people together in order to form an actual council of the people with these that I just mentioned as the voting members. We got an awful lot of input on some things that, that are wrong, uh, that need correction, and uh, I can go over some of these things with you, but a real good example of that is when the warriors come back and they apply for disabilities, the Veterans Administration has 1,100,000 applications that they are not moving. They are not moving them because they are just overwhelmed with so many applications. So they're trying to get their data processing system up to the point where it can accept and process those particular applications. Lots of people, we don't want to see people who have a disability and need to get paid through the Veterans Administration. 
We don't want to see them sleeping under bridges. We don't want them to do that. We want them to get what they what is due to them. Yeah. The second thing is we're concerned with health care. When you get old, health care is very important. Uh, when we enlisted in the military, we were promised three hots, a cot, and health care for life. Yep. That's what they told us back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But it changed somewhere along the line, and not everybody got what they were supposed to get. Now, if you make it to the point where you're age 65, you can do pretty well on health care because Medicare picks it up, and if you're retired, TRICARE takes on the second one. Right. And if TRICARE doesn't, then the VA picks up secondary. But the VA hospitals are few and far between. Fortunately, they are building some four more clinics in Vegas. Doesn't help us here. But here in Pahrump, we have a clinic, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how many people they service there. I think it's 4,000 veterans that they have on their rosters for the Pahrump area. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And it sounds like the manpower just isn't there for all the, the veterans. Uh, you got to work on something, as always. You know, we got to got to take care of the guys that are taking care of us. Sorry, Major, I hate to cut you short, but uh, our time is up. Oh. We'll see how quick it goes. You know, if you'd like to come back on the show again and uh, talk some more about this, I'd be more than happy to hear it. So I thank my guest, Sergeant Major Ferguson, for being on the show. Command Sergeant Major, excuse me. So we'll be looking for you as next week on uh, Semper Fi. So until then, Semper Fi and hoorah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.